Christ is risen. risen It's great to be together this morning and so good to be part of this service. Loved uh, seeing uh, those three Thompsons, uh, or one Labib these days, sorry Mark, but uh, uh, sharing about how Jesus has changed their lives. Uh, We're going to have a look at uh, a couple of stories today um, and... um, and uh, we're going to have a think about uh, what the resurrection means to us. Now, I wonder if you've ever had something so precious that you thought it would last forever and only to be disappointed it broke, perished, you lost it, or someone stole it. In primary school, I had a T-shirt which I absolutely loved. It was this white Harley Davidson T-shirt. I thought I was so cool. I would wear it everywhere. And um, I was at a party, in, I think it was year six, year five, and there was this girl that I kind of liked. I was interested in her. And, you know, I went to the party wearing my Harley Davidson t-shirt. And she said to me, why do you always wear that (laughs) t-shirt? Don't you have anything else to wear? And in that moment, that t-shirt perished, spoiled, (laughs) and faded, and I could never wear it again. I remember the first car I ever bought. Uh, It was in my 30s, and it was a very special moment. And I wonder if you've had one of these moments where you, you know, you make this decision, no one eats any food in the car. And uh, how long does that last? Lasts like a month, and then a month later, there are chip packets lying everywhere, popcorn in all the crevices of the car, banana smooshed into the seats, and it starts to perish, spoil, and fade. A friend of mine asked me if I had a copy of The Lord of the Rings that she could borrow and, uh, and read. I said, I do have a copy of The Lord of the Rings, but no, you cannot borrow it. <laughs> I don't want it to perish, spoil, or freight, and I don't want you forgetting to return it. So here is my copy of Lord of the Rings. I read it with cotton gloves. No, not really, but I'm not willing to lend it out to anyone else. Uh, There are things in our life and the things that bring great disappointment that we love so much, things that are perished, that perish, spoil or fray. They can get lost, broken or stolen. And obviously the greatest grief that we face in life is the grief of those people who are most precious to us who are taken from us. I remember the first day my first child was born, day zero, holding this precious little girl in my arms. And I remember thinking, what have I done? (laughs) What have I done bringing a child, fragile, into this world where she'll have a one in three chance of getting cancer? that she'll have a high chance of having mental health issues in her teenage years, that she's going to get her heart broken by some boy one day, and there's nothing I can do to take away that suffering. Easter Sunday is the promise that this broken, spoiled, perishing world will one day be resurrected to eternal life. The Bible puts it this way, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept under lock and key for you in heaven. This Easter Sunday means, Jesus' resurrection means you have an inheritance if you trust in Jesus. You have a place with God that will never perish, that will never spoil, it will never fade. Easter is the promise that death is not the end and that those who trust in Christ will be reunited with their loved ones in the presence of God after death. It is a glorious promise. The message of Easter is not that Jesus died and so that one day we'll float around with disembodied soul in an ethereal realm. No, no, the king of all the universe, he died for us and rose bodily. Historically, people saw him, touched him. Hundreds of people did. He is alive And if we trust him, 
one day he will bring us back to an embodied life, richer, fresher, and more beautiful than anything we have ever felt this far on earth. The story in the Gospels that was just read for us earlier is about how humans respond when confronted by the threat of death. Uh, I love Rembrandt's portrayal of this scene in the Gospels. Uh, The storm on the Sea of Galilee, 1633. Couldn't read it from the screen over there. It is a beautiful painting in which he manages to so perfectly capture the chaos of the men in the storm. The painting is still, but the scene is very much alive. We see the disciples in the boat as it's violently hurled upon a wave in the storm-tossed sea and rocks loom on the left foreground. At the front of the boat, there are several men desperately trying to take down the sails. And we can see that the rigging rope is already ripped away from its mooring and a torn sail is flying about in the wind. While the five in the front of the boat battle the storm, there's eight in the back hanging on for dear life. There's the bearded man on the far right, determinedly hanging on to the rudder, but we can see that his efforts are futile since it isn't even touching the waters. One man vomits over the side, while another man behind him huddles in prayer, and in the center are two men worried, waking Jesus from sleep, questioning him why he doesn't care that they are about to perish. We're told their words in the Gospels. Teacher, don't you care if we drown? We're perishing. We're perishing. We're perishing. Don't you care? And although we know that a second later Jesus will flatten the storm with just a word and bring it to a peaceful calm, Rembrandt chooses this moment the moment before the storm calms. He chooses this, the most dramatic moment of the story, when everything feels hopeless, when death seems certain, and when it seems like there's no hope at all. Why would he choose this moment for his artwork? Rembrandt lived in tumultuous times and violent times in the 17th century. His own life was haunted by tragedy and hardships. In essence, he's inviting us to recognize the frailty of our own lives, the reality of our own mortality, the unpredictability of the day of our death. Whether we'll admit it or not, we are all in the storm. That's what he's saying. We're in the boat with the disciples, and death is as certain. And we wonder, does God even care? That's why he paints this. I was reading an interview with Chris Hemsworth uh, this week who um, told uh, about the story of filming for the National Geographic documentary, Limitless. Uh, The series is about health and longevity, and in episode five, they take his blood work and they do a whole bunch of tests on him and discover that he has an increased risk of Alzheimer's disease. And in this interview, November last year, he was interviewed for Vanity Fair, and this is what he said upon finding out that he has this increased risk. He says, most of us, we like to avoid speaking about death in the hope that we'll somehow avoid it. We all have this belief that we'll figure it out, and then to all of our sudden be told some big indicators are actually pointing to this as the route which is going to happen, it really sinks in your own mortality. He's in the storm. It reminds me of Damien Hurst's contemporary artwork, The Physical Impossibility of Death in the Mind of Someone Living. Uh, Hurst um, has a full-size tiger shark preserved in formaldehyde. And you can go and stand up against this full-sized tiger shark. And I I read one writer describing the impression 
it had standing before this shark. She wrote, when you walk around Hearst's enormous shark and stare into its gaping mouth, it's easy to imagine that you're about to be eaten. Hearst is practically offering you a near-death experience, one that could give you a fresh perspective on your own life, knowing that death will inevitably come. And yet, the concept he's introducing you to is impossible to comprehend. You look into the shark's mouth and you imagine you're going to die, but only to turn around, whisper to your husband something like, whoa, freaky, and then you start to discuss where to, where to find the best falafel, <laughs> the physical impossibility of death in the mind of someone living. We must come to terms with our mortality, but we find it very difficult to do this. The brevity of life is picked up also in the Spanish painter Sergei Cadena's illusory dual image portraits, which have a mesmerizing effect in which the portrait appears to transform as the viewer shifts vantage point. In a single canvas, the viewer sees a young girl and then a woman, and then she becomes an elderly lady. Isn't that a stunning artwork? The storm shows us how tremendously small, insecure, and helpless we are before death. Life is fragile and brief. And this fragility of life and the certainty of death, it plays a central role in the creation of much of the world's art because art is a way of getting our attention. Art is a way of arresting us to consider the things that we refuse to consider. Art makes us pay attention to that which we desperately try and ignore, and death is one of those things. Death is a dreadful thief. It's not that it just reduces us to dust and ashes, it robs us of nearly everything we value. It not only takes our health, our strength, our life, it destroys the people we love. It destroys our friendships, our family. It brings so much sorrow and grief that it feels like we're physically dying in the midst of that grief. It's God who has told us that death is the consequence of humanity's rebellious autonomy. It's because we are the creatures who want to rule the world without our Creator. And as a result, we are unwilling, we are unworthy to live beyond our creation. God says there's a limit to how long I will let you live in this world. And the consequence is death. Do you remember God's promise to Adam was that as soon as he ate from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he would die. And we're surprised because he eats and he keeps living. And we think he's living. But the Bible calls what he was living through a death. That physical life that we have here is nothing like the life God had intended for us. We are like cut flowers. The moment a flower is cut, it's dead. It may bloom, it may flourish in a vase of water, but it's dead. It may give the sweet perfume of life, but it's dead. Just wait and see. The petals will weep and fall. The leaves will fold and fail. The water will become rank and foul. And the sweet perfume of life will turn into the stench of death. That is our life. One brief journey on earth feels like a lifetime and yet in reality is but a few days of existence. But God in his love, Easter is all about God sending his son into the world to die our death, bearing the punishment of our rebellion so that in rising three days later, we might be given the same resurrection life that he has. And that's what we all wait for. The disciples come to Jesus saying, don't you care if we drown? Don't you care if we perish? For the men in the boat with Rembrandt, the storm was not their first encounter with death. 
very early in Jesus' ministry, they had followed Jesus to a town called Nain in the foothills of Mount Tabor, southeast of Nazareth. Coming to a village, they heard the unmistakable cries of mourners coming from the little village. They then trickled out of the gate, and four men came carrying a funeral stretcher. The dead man's mother followed behind, weeping. And the disciples look around for the dead man's father, the dead man's brothers, but there were none. All they saw was his mother, a widow, and this was his, her only son. A loss like this meant that the widow would have no one to care for her in her old age. Those who knew her situation all felt the same sting. No mother should have to bury her own child. In those days, people looked to their religious leaders to make sense of death and the grief it caused. But when Jesus' disciples looked to him, they didn't see a man composing a speech, but a man ready to enter into the grief of the woman and turn it to joy. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her. Literally, the Greek word here is splegizomai. It means he was gutted deeply on the insides. The most common emotion Jesus is described to have had in the Gospels is this very word, splegizomai, deeply moved from the bowels. His heart went out to her, and he said to her, don't cry. His words were tender, but words alone wouldn't stop the tears, so he went up and touched the bier they were carrying him on, and the bearers stood still. What is this guy doing, touching this dead body? The weeping ceased. There was surprise and confusion on the faces of the villagers. And then Jesus said, young man, I say to you, get up. And the dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. Don't you love that detail? He gave him back. That's what we all long for, that which is lost and spoiled and perished and been stolen, that given back. This is what Jesus does. He comes to give life to the dead. And they were filled with awe and praise God. A great prophet has appeared. And they said, God has come to the help of his people. This was unlike anything the crowd and the disciples had ever seen. Report of the miracle spread around Judea. Great crowds flocked to Jesus. He was the one who gave the dead back their life. This was a world with no shortage of need. People continued to bring the sick, bring the dying, bring the blind, bring them in droves. And after a day of healing the multitudes, Jesus gets in a boat with his disciples to cross to the other side of the lake. He falls asleep. He is so exhausted from his work of healing people. But then he awakes to the dripping, desperate faces shouting over the noise of the storm, saying, wake up. Don't you care if we drown? Don't you care? Now, it's an ironic question, given the reason Jesus had been asleep in the boat was because he was exhausted from caring for the crowds of sick that he had healed the previous day. The masses sought him because not only did he care about them perishing, he stopped it. He even reversed it. But there in the boat, paralyzed with fear, the disciples weren't quite sure. They knew he could do something about it, but he was asleep. And so they knew this would only end in one of two ways, either in death or a miracle, but Jesus is asleep. He's taking a nap. The worst thing ever is about to happen. Doesn't he care? Now, one of the most 
interesting features of this artwork is that there are 14 men on the boat. There are five in the sunlit bow battling the tempest. There are eight others in the darkened stern hanging on for dear life. And then there's Jesus, five plus eight plus one equals 14. But weren't there only 12 disciples? Who is the 14th man? Who is this guy in green, holding his hat, looking directly at us? We discover it's Rembrandt himself. He has painted himself into the storm. Now, why would he do that? Rembrandt often puts himself into the paintings. And so, if you have a look at the, his painting, The Prodigal Son, in the brothel, you have Rembrandt, this glassy-eyed, drunk younger brother, looking at us over his left shoulder as he holds a pint in one hand and a woman in the other. What's he saying to us by this painting? He's saying he is a lost younger brother. He needs to be found. He is lost. And then there's the raising of the cross where Rembrandt strains with three other men to lift the cross of Jesus into its base on Golgotha. There he is at the foot of the cross. And what is he saying to us? He's saying, Jesus is here because of my sin. This is what it cost him to forgive me. And again, in a final painting, there he is in the storm. He's asking us to imagine ourselves in the boat with him. He's looking at us with the same terror on his face as the disciples asking, do you reckon Jesus cares that we're about to drown? Where is God in the storm? Can he do anything about it? Or are we alone in a cruel and indifferent universe? By painting himself into the boat, Rembrandt wants us to know that he believes that his life will either be lost in the sea of chaos or preserved by the Son of God. Those are his only two options. And by peering through the storm and out of the frame to us, he asks if we are not in the same boat. What about you? Do you realize that these are your only two options? To perish or to be saved by the Lord in the storm. Now, I take it that this artwork, this is the reason why this artwork held such a prized position in Isabella Stewart Gardner's collection. Isabella was America's first great art collector. She lived 1840 to 1924. She came to know the fragility of life and the grief of death all too well when her two-year-old son died in 1865. Heartbroken, she and her husband Jack began traveling the world, collecting art as a way of quieting their grief. Both were from wealthy families, which enabled them to amass a world-class collection. Botticelli, Raphael, Manet, Degas, Vimeur, and Rembrandt. Then in 1898, Jack died. And Isabella was once again thrown into grief. And she again turned to art as she had done when she lost her son. Her collection had grown so large that she felt it would be improper to keep it all to herself. So she purchased a plot of land in Boston and began designing an Italian Renaissance palazzo for her museum, just like the ones she used to visit with Jack when they were younger. Absolutely stunning. She said that this would be a museum for the enjoyment of the public forever. She was adamant that it remained in the way she had designed it forever, just the way she'd stipulated. 
and that if any changes were ever made to her collection after death, then the entire collection would have to be sent to Paris for sale and the proceeds donated to Harvard University. This would be, this was meant to be a permanent home for the art she loved so much. Isabella Stewart Gardner, she was a woman of sorrows. She was acquainted with grief and she wanted to bring something into this world that would not perish, spoil or fade. And so she chose art. She was asked why she was so intent on protecting the, uh, the gallery in this way and she said, I want my museum to live it must live, and if you've ever been to her museum, you will know it's a stunning, life-giving place. And Rembrandt's storm on the Sea of Galilee hung in a privileged place. For all to see, giving comfort and hope to those who are likewise facing the o their own storms, asking their own questions, does God care? But on March 19, 1990, something happened which would change everything. At 1.23 a.m., the security guard sitting behind the main desk buzzed in two uniformed police officers who said that they'd received a report of a disturbance in the museum's courtyard and they needed to check it out. On the inside, the officer asked the guard if he had noticed anything unusual and if there was anyone else on duty that night. The guard told them, yes, we had a partner upstairs, but no, they hadn't noticed anything unusual. The lead officer said, well, go and call your partner down here. The second officer studied the security guard's face as he made the call, and then he said, hey, you look familiar. Is there a warrant out for your arrest? The security guard looked surprised <laughs> and insisted, no, 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 of course not. But the question unsettled him. The police officers asked him to come out and show, him, show them his ID, ID. So the security guard stepped out from behind the desk and away from the only silent alarm button in the museum, he handed his driver's license over and after studying the license, the police officer cuffed the guard and said, you're under arrest we're taking you in. Just then, the second watchman on duty that night came around the corner, and the officers immediately put him in handcuffs too. Surprised, the second guard said, why are you arresting me? And the officer said, you're not being arrested, you're being robbed, don't give us any problems, and you won't get hurt. They then bound the guards in the basement and spent the next 81 minutes selecting and loading 13 irreplaceable works of art into a vehicle waiting outside, including Rembrandt's The Storm on the Sea of Galilee. They drove off successfully, committing the most valuable robbery in history with an estimated value of more than half a billion dollars worth of art. That happened in 1990, and for the past 33 years, Rembrandt's A Storm in the Sea of Galilee has been in the wind. There's a $10 million award for the recovery of the Gardner art. So far, no one has stepped forward to claim the reward. There have been no arrests, no demands for ransom, no legitimate sightings. And the tragedy, of course, is with $10 million on the table, it's likely that the artwork has been destroyed. Investigators estimate that 20% of stolen art ends up destroyed. The stress and inconvenience of holding such a precious public treasure ends up being more than the thieves bargained for. With nowhere to turn and no way to give it back, they end up destroying their prize. If anybody knew something about it, with $10 million down on the table, something would have happened by now. When the police came to investigate the crime the following day, they discovered that 
Although the thieves had plenty of time to handle the art with care, they chose not to. Rather than risk getting caught with a five-foot canvas in a frame, the thieves took a box knife and cut the painting out of the frame. Now remember, this was Isabella's personal collection, which she and her husband had curated together. She designed this, meet, this museum as a way of dealing with her own grief, the death of her child, the death of her husband. And she, remember, she, she wanted something to live. Remember the rule she put down that if ever there was a change to the gallery, something was taken from it or added to it, the whole thing had to get sold and the proceeds go to Harvard University. So when that painting was cut out of its frame, because of that rule, they had to put the empty frame back up on the wall. And so if you go to the Isabel Gardner Stewart Museum in Boston today and you go to the Dutch room, where the painting was cut out of the frame, the frame's still there. It's still there on the wall, an empty frame with no sign of the disciples in the boat, no Jesus, no Rembrandt, all are lost. It's a powerful metaphor, isn't it, of the loss, the grief, the empty space in our lives when those most precious are taken away from us. Museum goers who visit the Dutch Museum, passing by, they say it's like passing by the grave of a loved one. They call it an unholy tragedy. They, they say they're offended by the, the theft, not because of how much stolen art was worth, but because what the thieves did was rude. It's disrespectful to Isabella's gift, inconsiderate to her grief. Remember, death is a thief. The horror we feel about this is nothing compared to the horror we feel in the empty frames that are left when people depart our life. Isabella Stewart Gardner had a similar experience to the widow Jesus met from Nain. She carried her sorrows to this place in the hope of finding some rest. When she lost her baby in a sea of grief, she turned to beauty for healing. When she lost her husband, she determined to create something that would not die, a museum that would live forever, that she would give to the world. Isabella was one person in a long line of many who have tried to interrupt the futility and finality of a decaying and dying world. The empty frame is a note that tells Isabella that though she may want to create something beyond the reach of death, this is not something our world affords. You can dress up the pain all you like, but nothing she has made will last forever. This is a world where thieves break in and steal. This is a world where beautiful things are destroyed. This is a world where precious treasures are never to be seen again. Rembrandt is saying to this to us in the artwork. Everyone in the boat knew this. Now, what does this have to do with Easter? Well, a moment later, Jesus stands up and he will rebuke the wind and the waves and everything will grow still with just a word, with just a word. And what Easter is about is because he died on the cross, because he rose from the dead, it's just a matter of time before he comes and puts everything right again. He's defeated death. Death no longer has any ultimate ability to triumph over those who believe a Christian is someone who is able to say the evil, the brokenness, the storms of the world will not ultimately prevail. This is a passing thing. This experience I'm going through right now, it's light. It will pass away. It will fall to pieces, but my Saviour and I, we will prevail. A Christian is someone who's able to say, let the waves come. 
Let the boat sink. Let things look really bad. Let things rage and storm. But I trust he will raise me from the grave on the last day. Do you care if we are perishing? A Rembrandt's word, uh, not Rembrandt's words, the sailor's words. Does Jesus care that we perish? Well, he does. And someday soon, he will flatten our storms. His triumph over the grave calls those who are perishing to be born again to a living hope. The peace he has brought by his resurrection isn't a myth. It's not a fantasy. It is an inheritance that will never perish, spoil, or fade. It's kept in heaven for you. If the storm on the Sea of Galilee still exists, Rembrandt, in all his glory, is tucked away in some closet or some vault hidden from the world. He's still clutching the rope, still trying to keep his hat from flying off his head, and he is looking out into our world for any who will make eye contact. If he still exists, it's quite a storm he is caught in, and us. But there's coming a day when Jesus will stand and say to all of us, Peace, be still. And his words will be followed by an unprecedented eternal calm. We'll enter into heaven and find our reward, knowing that helps us now. Even when we suffer, we grieve not as those without hope, I want to finish with one final artwork, and this artwork is, um, is, a, uh, is a tombstone. In 1751, Maria Magdalena Langhans died in childbirth on Easter Saturday. She was only 28 years old, and her baby died with her. There are few human experiences that could rival the tragedy and trauma of that day for her husband, George. In his mourning, he commissioned a sculpture uh, to, to make a sculpture to both remember his sweet family and to communicate his hope to others. Johann August Nahl took his hammer and chisel and from a single block of stone sculptured this, it was placed over her tomb on the church floor in a church in Switzerland. It shows the doors of death broken and George's beloved wife and child being raised again to life by the Lord Jesus. I love this sculpture because it shows that there is a day coming when the grave will not be able to hold those who belong to Jesus because the last enemy death will be destroyed. George's hope was based on the historical reality that Jesus of Nazareth rose from the grave on the third day. And in doing that, he conquered death and he offers eternal life to all who believe in him. That's what Easter's about. If Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of all who have fallen asleep. And he's coming back for us. Don't you long for that day. Let me pray for us. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the living hope that you have given us by the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. We praise you that he, the Lord of life, is alive right now. That he controls all the details of our lives. That he permits for a season the storms of sadness and sickness to assail us, that we might turn to him in faith. We realize that there is no promise he will lift us out of these storms that we find ourselves in life, but that great, big storm of death, he is defeated. And he will safely bring us through that and into his presence. 
help us to trust you. The Lord Jesus said to the disciples in the ship, do you have no faith? After all they'd seen of Jesus healing the sick, raising the dead, did they still not believe they were safe with God in their lives? Heavenly Father, we too give us that faith that might trust Jesus in life and in death. It's in his name we pray. Amen.